Hi, welcome to the Methods for Driver Practice and Drivetrain Training Fall Workshop. Um, we've got some great panelists here today. We're very excited um, to have this conversation. Um, so I think we'll get started just with the panelists introducing themselves a little bit. Um, Hi, my name is Bill Kendall. Uh, I'm the lead mentor for Team 2073 Eagle Force Robotics. We're based out of Elk Grove, California. Um, this is actually my second team uh, that I have mentored uh, in my career with first. Uh, I've been the first for 17 years now, six, 17 uh, successive seasons with first. And uh, back in 2018, I was fortunate enough to uh, win the Woody Flowers finalist award at the Sacramento Regional. Awesome. Uh, my name is Mike Rossetto. I'm the lead technical mentor for 1678 Citrus Circuits based out of Davis, California. I've been mentoring 1678 uh, since 2008, and I was a, a student uh, on an FLL team starting in 2001, and then I was a four-year member of uh, Team uh, 114 uh, Eagle Strike uh, in uh, the Silicon Valley Bay Area. Um, and uh, I was also fortunate to uh, be uh, selected as a Woody Flowers finalist in uh, the 2016 Sacramento Regional. And my name is Ellie Bear. I am a student on 1678, and I will be the moderator today. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask our panelists, please put them in the YouTube chat and I will be watching that and you can ask our presenters some questions. Um, so let's get started. Bill, what's your process for driver selection? Well, it's interesting. Um, I actually learned this, I think I kind of learned this one from Mike, uh, believe it or not. Uh, he, was, he was observing us at one point in one of the off seasons and uh, he told, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of concerned about, you know, who we're going to choose for driver. And he says, you already have a driver. Uh, and he was referring to the, one of our students who was driving uh, during the off season. And, and it was related to how well she was driving at the time. It was very obvious that she was a good driver. And I've, I've learned, and this probably came to me through several years uh, with uh, different approaches. Uh, and that's that we now choose our off, our driver in the off season for the upcoming season. Um, we base that on many different criteria. Um, primarily, the student has to have been with the team uh, for a, you know at least a year and has been a big contributor. Um, one of the things that we want to avoid is is having a student that shows up just to drive the robot. Um, that just doesn't work. Uh, they have to be a big part of the team. Um, every single one of our drivers for the past several seasons have been uh, students who have either been in their junior or senior year. Um, and that what that does is that gives them multiple seasons of experience of seeing what tournament play is like. Um, and then they can then fill that role. Now, we've actually shifted our approach a little bit uh, we are now actually trying to look to getting students um, that are a bit younger. Uh, we've actually had a couple of students join our team uh, between their seventh and eighth grade year. Now, they aren't necessarily in line to be drivers yet, but they definitely um, are contributors. A student that shows up at, with a passion for doing what we do in uh, seventh grade, eighth grade, is a student who's contributing to the team immediately. Uh, it's absolutely amazing to see it from the youngest students. But our goal by looking now at uh, possibly having a younger driver is that by the time they are a junior or senior, they've got two or three seasons of actual competition under their belt. And there's, there's just something special about spending time behind the glass driving a competition robot that uh, changes the way a driver drives. So we find that we choose this. We choose the driver in the off season based on their performances at uh, off season tournaments, and then uh, what that gives us as an advantage 
once we've chosen that driver is from that point on, we can then design the drive software and code and mechanisms based on that driver's skill levels and preferences so that we're actually tuning our robot to a driver instead of trying to have the driver figure out how to manipulate that robot. Um, and the other thing you're going to find is you have, you'll always have students that are naturals at that, that eye-hand coordination that is needed for driving. Um, and that plays a, it plays a, you know, a, a role in our selection process, but it by no means is the determining factor, although we do look for that. Um, there are students that are really good at it, and there's some students that they just, they don't, they don't click with a robot. And, you know, it's, it's sad to say, sorry, you can't drive, but quite honestly, we want the, the robot to perform its best, and that means we choose the driver that, that uh, actually does the best. So, you know, there's multiple things is, is how we choose our driver. Um, we haven't always done it that way, though. So uh, it's something we've learned over the years. And I think, Mike, we learned a lot of that from you. Is that right? I think your processes are too dissimilar. I think you're muted, Mike. Sorry, guys. Uh, let's kick over to my slides, and I, I wanted to highlight a couple of things that we're doing as well. Because, yeah, Bill, I think, I think we've converged on a couple of things. Um, so for, for drive team selection, I, this is one thing that is probably unique to our team, but maybe other teams are in a similar spot. Um, I've been drive coaching for um, many seasons now, uh, probably getting up to you know, 10, 12 years as a drive coach. Um, so the, the team in our team handbook has kind of put the drive team selection responsibility on my shoulders. So, um, I'm given the you know the kind of responsibility of of managing that selection process that we're talking about. Um, my my process actually looks like reaching out to specific students um, in the summer for a brief interview. Um, uh, this inherently means that I'm selecting students that have been on the team before. Um, we we don't put uh, rookie team members in the in the drive team role. Um, but I'll reach out to some students that um, I think have the mix of what's needed for being in, in the drive team. And I'll actually have a picture of what I'm hoping for, like with specific roles as well. Um, and then um, th in those interviews, I'm trying to gauge um, primarily what the interest level is from the students, but also what they feel like their ability to commit to the, the time requirements and the effort uh, needed to participate in the drive team. Um, another thing I'm thinking about beyond just, um, level of, uh, commitment, um, is, um, uh, what the range of technical skills that we have on the drive team are. So, uh, one thing that first did the last couple of years that is really great is they added a technician role. So you can have a non drive team, a, a non drive team role person as the technician to help support any robot issues but there's still not one student on our team that knows everything about the robot uh, hardware and software. And so it requires a multi-skilled um, group of students to effectively maintain the robot through the competition uh, when we're on the field doing last minute repairs, things like that. So I try to make sure that um, all of the drive team members have some technical um, uh, competencies related to the robot because every person is important. Uh, to leverage their skill sets for last minute robot fixes and stuff like that. But I also try to make sure that we have a spread of skills so that there's at least one software robot um, member, there's at least one electrical member, there's at least one um, you know hardware uh, mechanical member uh, on the drive team so that we have that spread of skills to support any last minute issues. Um, and then I think Bill mentioned this, um, you know, but um, we, we try to select students that we can build into over a couple of years. Um, and so ideally we're not picking uh, seniors if it's their first year on the drive team. Um, I also re-interview anyone who's a returning drive team member. So I don't, I don't take for granted like any roles year over year carryover. Um, obviously I, that's what I'm aiming for is, is carryover year over year. So our operator or our base driver are the same uh, for the tenure of when they're selected through their uh, senior year. But sometimes it's not the best fit, and so that's that's what the interviews help 
determine is, hey, you know, you were a drive team member last year. How did it go? Um, do you think it's a good fit for you this year with your other roles and responsibilities? And sometimes the answer is no. Maybe they're taking on another leadership role in the team and they don't have the bandwidth for both. But, um, you know, in general, we're hoping for for rollover of roles. Um, Bill, I think you mentioned, and I think this is probably going to be where, you know, kind of our experience comes into play, but you mentioned that uh, you haven't always done your drive team selection the way that you do it right now. So do, you, do you, could you elaborate a little bit more on maybe, um, you know, some of the ways that you used to do drive team selection and then in particular, like what were some of the, um, maybe the, um, the, the cons of that approach or some of the, some of the negatives sure. that you are avoiding now with your process? Yeah. Um, typically what we used to do is we would design and build a robot and then we would have driver, you know, tryouts. And, uh, you know, we would just have students come in and, and uh, drive the robot around, uh, do whatever aspects of the game were uh, needed that year. Uh, and then we would just pick somebody who seemed to do it the best. And honestly, what that does is it, it opens the door for having uh, inexperienced students uh, driving the robot. You know, and, and when the entire team is working hard to design and build a robot, um, having a fresh driver every year uh, actually can not let allow the students hard work to shine on the field as it were. Um, so yeah, and it also gives you, you know, you don't, you won't have somebody who's had two or three or four years of experience um, in competition uh, because once you get behind the glass, things are, things are a little bit different. The stress level, it's a little bit higher, you know, um, I'm certain you can, do. in fact, speaking of behind the glass, that's your drive coach. I do not take on that role anymore because I learned that uh, I get a little heated sometimes and sometimes I can yell at the wrong person. So uh, we actually have a drive coach who's really, really good at taking on that role. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's actually one of our former students. He's an alumni for the team, Garrett. I'm sure you're familiar with Garrett. Anyways, um, oh, yeah. yeah, and so we, you know, we don't we don't use that method anymore um, because we found it's just not as effective in the long run. Um, you know, and when our our students see a driver who is obviously a contributor to the team, obviously skilled at what they do, and doesn't get um, stressed out when they're you know in a competition situation it gives everybody that level of confidence to do their best and know that it's going to be handled well on the field so you know that's that's really why we've we've kind of and we've seen success too since we've started the selection during the off season everybody knows who it's going to be um we've seen a lot more uh success in tournament play by taking yeah. it on taking that approach now I think I think a, yeah, th those are really great points, Bill. I think a couple other things that I thought of that really pushed us to the model we're in right now is is saving time and reducing drama. Um, so, yeah. in particular, I think what a lot of teams do, and and teams that like sixteen seventy eight used to do this, and the team I was on in high school did it this way, is we would run driver practice with the competition robot after it was you know, mostly built and we would run like drills and stuff and everyone would get a chance to do it. You'd like write all these scores yeah. on the whiteboard and stuff like that. And um, that took up a ton of time during the build season where your time is everything and you need to spend time fixing the robot or making improvements or practicing with yeah. your competition drive team, getting ready for the competition and you're spending time having everybody on the sticks. And and granted, if you're a team that wants to give everyone stick time, that's great. Just do it in the fall. Don't do it, you know, in between uh, February and March when your time with the robot is super limited. Um, and then also, like, running drive team selection in that time window is just, like, it's a perfect, like, storm of drama because everybody is, like, tired and sleep-deprived after two months of build season. And yeah. there's all this pressure ramping up for your competition season. And by making the drive team like the focus of your team in that highly concentrated window, it's a it's a powder keg. 
of, yeah. of emotions and uh, and yeah. frankly, I've seen teams like split up and community yeah. teams form because students couldn't be drivers on their team, right? And and that's yeah. just because of a poor, it's a poorly managed situation all around. So by moving the drive team selection way to the beginning of your of your off season, you know, like like you guys are doing and what we do during yeah. the summer, it it offloads all that like tension and allows the whole team to function as a as a full unit for the entire year. So. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely agreed. Uh, hey, real quick, we got a question from Robotic Sniper. Um, he's asking if, if we choose a backup driver. Um, I don't know about you guys. I know that we always have a second driver um, specifically chosen already just for those off instances that our main driver uh, has to have a you know an interview for a, a, an award or something and they can't make a match or uh heaven forbid they get sick like students get sick you know <laughs> and uh it's yeah we definitely have a backup driver every time and, and they spend almost as much practice time as the primary driver does because we want to make sure that we're we have at least we're at least too deep hmm. yeah we we don't have a practice driver but uh but we probably should <laughs> we just don't. It, it, I think. I think a couple of times we've had someone that has like off-season drive experience fill in if if really needed, but uh, we, yeah. we typically don't. Yeah. Just different approaches. Yep. All right. Should we move on to our next question, Ellie? Yep. Or our next uh, um, panel question. Uh, what's the goal of your driver and drive team training? Actually, that's really good. Um, let me give you the big picture view first. And and that's the, when there, actually, I think this is, did I even respond to that? No. Um, big picture view is we want our drive team so completely comfortable with what they're doing that they're not thinking about what they're doing, right? Uh, you don't want a driver have to say, okay, if, for me to make, the system shoot, I have to pull this button. And to turn right, I want my joystick to go this way. You want them to be so comfortable with driving that they are uh, instinctively driving. Um, so what we do is, is our, uh, our goal is to get the, uh, the team driving uh, fluidly. Uh, so it's as though one person's operating the entire system because you always have a pilot and a co-pilot, right? And what we want to do is we want them to operate the robot as one, as though, as though it was one person doing it. Perfect example, I remember, I think it was back in 2012, the first time I actually saw um, our robot, we were at uh, Madtown, right? Madtown, last tournament of the year. And suddenly our robot is operating perfectly smoothly and it's as though one person's operating it it's like we finally got to that point now granted this is this is late in the season right this was back when we were using the different approach to our drive team where we we pick the driver from based on the whole criteria of of who does the best and then try to pick a, a co-pilot and so finally by the end of the season they had so many tournaments so many matches together that the robot was operating as a single person was doing it. So what we want them to be able to do is now our, our goals are at the beginning of the season, we choose our team strategy for how we want to play the game. And then during our uh, practice sessions, we have them practice with each of the individual elements of the game Till they get really good at that and then we piece all those elements together um, into an, a match so that they can play our strategy without being told what to do right by the drive coach but we also want them so comfortable with the strategy and the operation of the robot that when the drive coach changes the strategy on the fly because match dynamics, sometimes you have to vary your strategy a little bit. All the drive coach has to tell them to do is what to do, and they go do it. They don't have to think about how they pull it off because they're so comfortable with the operation of the robot that everything is instinctive. 
and they, they operate together. They've had so much practice time together that they, um, they can anticipate what each other is doing. And you'll watch our drive team. If you watch up really close, they're not verbally speaking to each other a whole lot because they know what each other is doing because they practice together. Eh, granted, sometimes you have to talk to each other, and there is that communication, but it can be really noisy um, behind the glass. And so having them super comfortable with each other is really our ideal, that they can execute strategy without being told what to do, and they can switch it up as needed um, when the dynamics of the match dictate that they need to or their drive coach tells them they need to. So that's our basic goals for our driver team training. Um, how do you go about doing it, Mike? Yeah, so a couple of um, goals that we have. Um, I think running a lot of drive team training allows you to um, like exercise the, um, the overall commitment of your drive team. And this may seem like a little abstract, but um, in essence, the the capacity for your drive team to show up, practice hard, run drills, swap batteries out quickly, do it again, cool the motors, do it again. That all is reinforcing this idea that the drive team is there to help the overall team succeed. So um, those drive team practice sessions give me an opportunity to coach our drive team up in that in that specific mentality. So if um, if there's a lack of follow up on showing up for practices or a lack of hustle when we're on the practice field, um, I have the ability to, but you know, ideally we're running cycles that we would normally run in a competition. Um, like last year, you know, driving under the trench, shooting, driving back under the trench, picking up balls, driving under the trench, shooting, like doing that drill over and over again, which is a, a route we ran often at competition. Another great thing about drive team training is uh, getting runtime on the robot to identify issues. I mean, we get the most runtime on the robot by testing our autos and doing drive practice. So the more drive practice we're doing, the more runtime we're getting on the robot and the more opportunities we have to identify issues. Um, and then I think, Bill, you mentioned this, but you know, the coordination between drive team members, specifically having the operator and the driver in sync, but also having the operator and driver in sync with um, a human player if there's any coordinated mm -hmm. action that the human player needs to do like dumping balls in the robot things like that get um 2015 was a great example with that shoot door with the uh the slidey yeah. and the shoots going up and down like you, that that human player had to practice and they had to be ready right when the driver was lined up to start going and direct the driver if they were off alignment things like that so getting uh yeah. the coordination between the drive team members down is a huge part of this yeah i remember watching your uh your recycle rush team uh, you had your driver, you had your co-pilot, and you had your human player. And that human player got a workout every single match. You know, loading the bins, yep. it was just it's crazy watching that. So, yeah, it's yep. and that's what, what you're mentioning there is, is that's the whole team, right? The whole drive team. It's not just the pilot, co-pilot. And you're right, the human player absolutely has to have uh, be part of that practice so that they're all working together as a unit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what do you got next for us, Allie? Ellie, sorry, oops. Uh, what method <laughs> do you use for driver training? Yeah, you see my first point there, practice, 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 and then Mike hit on that. I, you know, it's just, you literally, well, you know, Mike, one of your other, uh, one of your uh, big points that you like to use is um, fail fast, right? If you don't work your robot hard and fast, you're not going to know where it's going to fail. And that comes with driving it a lot. Um, but yeah, one of our methods is just practice every single day. Um, and you can't always do that because like you said also, um, sometimes you got to add components to your robot. You got to fix components on the robot that you broke. Uh, all of those things um, come up with lots of practice time. So. Uh, yeah, we we break down our practices uh, when we first, like you said, you even start your robot drive team practice uh, before it's finished, when it, it's finally ready to at least start doing it. And we break it down. So often, especially early on, we'll have them doing just some basic 
uh, driving on a single uh, flat piece of carpet, um, just trying to recreate a pattern. And then we'll add some obstacles. And then we'll have them run, or then we'll, we'll put up a like obstacle course to learn that the driver especially has to learn to be able to drive that robot forward, backwards, any which way. Um, and so we'll, we'll actually set up a course for them to practice on. Once they get very comfortable with driving, right, then we start having them driving with the field elements. So our process is, you know, first get the feel of the robot, help the programmers with tuning the drive control. Because our drive control, we have uh, what we call Eagle Drive, and it's, it's tunable software that changes the way that the robot responds to driver input. And we'll tune it to that driver's uh, preferences. And we start that process while they're doing simple driving, like just on the carpet, maybe with some stools or some milk crates or some balls, just something to give them um, you know, locating, be able to locate and maneuver the robot effectively. And we will tune the robot at that start that process at that point. Then we'll start working with the actual field elements uh, and getting it to where they can actually link all the steps in our um, in our strategy together, driving on our practice field. So, and again, back to practice, practice, practice. So that's our, our basic method is, you know, start simple and just make it more, you know, more complex, more complex until they're doing everything as smoothly and accurately as possible. Um, and, you know, a lot of times our robot at first won't even have the ability to use like limelight for self-alignment. Um, and so the, the drivers are practicing getting it as close as possible without limelight. Because, you know, sometimes limelight fails. Um, we actually have had that happen. Cameras fail. And so the driver has to take over. But those are all things that they're practicing. So hopefully we don't have to mm -hmm. deal with that scenario too often. But, yeah. So that's a, that's what that's part of our methods. What are you guys doing? Yeah, so I think a couple of keys for, for what we do. Um, doing, keeping a, at least a few robots running year over year is important. I know this is really hard, especially if you're a small team and you don't have uh, a lot of history and uh, your budgets aren't too big, but um, as best you can, try to at least keep your past year's robot running all the way up until you finished your next year's robot and you have to move the robo Rio over. Um, but keeping that robot running or multiple robots running is gonna give you options for just powering up a robot and starting driver practice. Um, starting early, I mean, this is another reason why we do our selections over the summer typically is we can we can hop in the shop in a normal year and uh, start, start going on drive base related drills right away. Um, Having those off seasons to go to is another big way to get driver training in. Uh, and it's not just the time at the off season. Obviously, you're going to want to make sure they're ready to go at the off season. So, you know, going to an off season inherently means you're going to be running practice before your off season to get ready. So there's there's a lot of opportunities there to get driver driver training in. Um, the last thing, and this is harder, but if you're already keeping multiple robots running year over year, you can get a lot more practice with defense and especially as your team gets more familiar with score building robots that can score uh, you know uh, significant volumes of points uh, defense is going to become more and more of a factor in your game plan and so we we make a specific point of practicing with defense because we know that when we get to a competition it's going to be coming at us and um, even if you think you're a team that might not get defended on i mean Defense can come to nearly any team in any match. And sometimes counter yeah. defense will come. So a lot of times we'll have a counter defender trying to block out their defender that we know is coming. And so your ability to handle a counter defender will allow you to play defense better. I mean, so the, the ability to getting familiar with how you interact with other robots and how you um, either hit them or avoid them is, is an important factor. Um, yeah. Bill, I think one thing we didn't talk about, but actually... I was thinking about it as you were sharing is how do you handle um i'm sure you haven't had a full practice field uh, available to you through your team's history no. so um how, how do you handle um like uh either practice field access limitations or limited space what's your advice there 
Well, fortunately, we've been uh, able to, through Capital City Classic and, and earlier on from uh, the Sacramento Regional, we've been able to get carpet so we can at least set up a, a quarter field or a half field. Um, even a half field in our shop and our environment is very difficult to set up. And so what we have to do is, is we have to kind of just fit it in as best we can. Now, fortunately, uh, the last couple of years, we've actually had a second room uh, as part of our shop area. And th in the second room, we can set up a half field now. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and so all we do, is we, we end up literally moving field elements around, um, setting them up. Uh, in as close a configuration to an actual field so that we can we can practice specific aspects of it um, yeah having a half a full full field would be fantastic it's just not an option for for us at least uh, half field we can usually get really close to that in our shop uh, it, but you just there's nothing like a full field <laughs> there's just not yeah so. Yeah, yeah, we just, I, you I, just I, do what you can. Yeah, uh, and I was thinking about the same thing. Um, you know, some things our team has done in the past, like I, I remember 2011 was like our first year we really got serious about driver practice, and it was the first year that we visited 254's shop when they were based out in NASA back in the day. And we, it was our first time doing full field practice uh, before a competition in our team's history. So finding resources near your team that have a, a yeah. larger field. I know you guys came over to our field this year, you know, before things yeah. shut down. And um, cause we, we don't have a full field either, but we had like uh, almost three quarters of one. And so it was a yeah. little bit more functional, right? And so it's all about like trying to pool the resources and then thinking creatively too. Like in 2013, 2014, we, um, we had a couple of rolls of carpet and we would unroll carpet in the cafeteria every Saturday yeah. and then roll it back up every Sunday. So we could do, we actually were able to do full length cycles in 2014 when that was really important to be able to practice, but we had to right. tear the field down every Sunday at the end of the, at the end of the weekend. So, you know, like you were saying earlier, like finding any sort of room or nook and cranny, getting a quarter field or a half field, it all can help, but it takes yeah. a lot of times it takes some work until you're able to build your program up to a point where you have right. more permanent access. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, even rolling carpet outside is still better than, than trying to, you know, put one element up on a small piece of carpet in your shop. It's just not, yeah. If you have to go outside, do it. You know, it's, it's worth yep. it. They, they drive practice on the, the biggest possible field configuration you can set up is, uh, is, absolutely worth the effort to do it like i said you had to set up your carpet and take it down it's worth it it's worth it yep. you know so yeah and you know you mentioned something earlier um if you guys well i know you saw it mike um i don't know how many people paid attention to us this last year uh we had a really effective robot when we were undefended and once we got to worlds our production level dropped a bit because people queued, up, queued in on, uh, we weren't as nearly as effective with a robot under defense. And it's absolutely sure. something we haven't been able to pull off much in our shop is taking the time to practice with defense. Lesson learned. Yeah, we're not yeah. gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna try to avoid that mistake. So going forward, but it's absolutely yeah. worth, you know, having your frustrate your driver that's the whole idea make your driver yeah. figure out how to do it right so yeah. yeah rc's got a great story about that when they're with their driver learning to drive their uh their swerve system you know try to stop them now their times practicing was well worth it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it paid off in 2019 right watching them drive that swerve around you could tell that they practiced with a lot of defense yeah, Big deal. yeah, it was it's it was a beautiful thing to watch. So totally, yeah. Um, we've got one more slide here. Um, what methods do you use for whole drive team training? Yeah, these are actually we we kind of touched on most of these already. Um, our, our methods are again start start with the basics and then build on kind of like like we always say when we're programming build it like an onion in one layer at a time 
Uh, same thing with our driver, our team practices. Uh, we have to have them working together and you have to start off simple stuff like can you can you grab the the hatch plate from the you know the loading station do that over and over and over until they're doing it smoothly every time uh, can you put the cargo in the ball in the in the rocket consistently and you have to do that but once you kind of build the individual pizzas then you start stringing them together as the entire uh, as the entire strategy would be used on an actual game match. Um, and, and again, I think, I, uh, I think I've got it right here, the ultimate goal of our drive team is so they can execute each one of their tasks without ever thinking about how to execute it because they are so experienced doing it. I mean, when you're driving your car, you don't think, reach over here, turn the turn indicator on so I can turn gear. You just do it, right? Driving is, the robot is the same way. We don't want our, students having to think about which button to push to uh, to launch the cargo or launch whatever the game piece is or to intake it. Uh, it's just instinctive. Um, but that all starts with the basics first and then adding each additional piece um, to that until it's all smooth and then do it again and again and again. That's the practice, practice, practice. I think um, uh, to add on to that, I mean, I, this all this practice is obviously it's a lot of hard work. Um, one thing that I encourage our drive team to do each year is to practice hard and practice smart. So we try to incorporate at least a baseline level of uh, measuring our practice results and incorporating that feedback into how we how we go uh, further in practice. So, for example, I'll have um, maybe a, like a, a, another team member an, as an observer taking notes on each practice round and noting things like how, how, like what was the production level like Bill, I think phrased it earlier, like how many balls did right. the robot score that match? Um, but also taking notes on things like what went wrong. Um, this is one area that I, that I know that if we're getting too caught up in our practice and we're not being careful about this, we'll miss this point, but it's important to note when something went wrong with the robot such that you cannot complete the match effectively, okay? So an example of this is like you you start a two and a half minute practice round, you get 30 seconds in and you pick up a ball the wrong way and it jams into a roller and mm -hmm. that's the rest of your match. You can't keep practicing, right? This is a very common thing. It's happened to our robots a million times, okay? The, the, the temptation is I wanna keep practicing, I'm gonna, hop on, pull the ball out, restart the clock, and let's start another round, okay? The problem is that if you are not taking careful note of that instance, then your team doesn't know to correct that before the competition, okay? Right. And and the, the issue here is a matter of, of the gravitas you put to driver practice versus the gravitas you put to a match on the field, okay? Right. To be frank, you're, you're driving the robot around, a ball gets jammed, you have to step out on the practice field, pull out the ball and restart your practice round. It, there's no sweat off your back in that instance. But you hop onto the real field and a ball jams in your intake 30 seconds in the match, you're losing that match and it's a pretty big right. deal, right? So yes. having this mentality of that what happens in the practice round matters, right? We need to take note of it and take careful, yeah. do some careful analysis on what's going on because that's gonna come back if we're not taking careful note of it now. We can do things now, we can ignore things now, but it's gonna come back to bite us. So you gotta be, you gotta be taking careful notes, you have to have good feedback, and you have to address all of your problems, not just push them aside because it only happened once or twice that day. Right, yeah, um, and, and, you know, in sports, yeah, uh, there, there's an analogy in sports, it's like practice like you play. And that's exactly what you're saying, is you gotta, you gotta practice and like you said, perfect example. We had a our uh, robot last year. We got stuck with a ball in it uh, in Monterey. Well, we realized we never practiced that scenario, and so we had to add some extra code in that would allow us to unjam that ball, right? And it's exactly what you're talking about. You know, if we practice that at home, we would have known, right? So, yeah, it's it's you got to practice hard, but you got to practice like you're going to play. Yep, absolutely. 
And that's where we talked a little bit about it, but having human players practice as well. Um, you know, so have have your actual human player there with you. I know the temptation could be like, oh, the human player is off, you know, working on another aspect of our team. Uh, like you gotta like maybe they don't need to be there every single time, maybe, but you really gotta bring them in and they need to be a key mm -hmm. component of your drive practice so that your whole team is on the same page. Um and then the, the last thing that, that I had noted based off this question was practicing line of sight conditions. So this is something that I think gets overlooked a lot, but I, I watch, um, I, I do like a lot of just like scouring the internet to see what other teams are posting on YouTube or whatever. So I'm always watching um, to see how other teams are developing their robots. And specifically I'll see teams of all sorts of resource levels do their practice. And one of the things that I see most often is I see teams practicing with their robot and their field elements and their drivers in orientations relative to each other that would be impossible in a real competition. And so a good example of this is like in 2017 with the uh, the pegs that you had to put the gears on and then where you had to pick up the gears, the when you place the, the, the gears on the pegs, there were three different gear spots, pegs, at three different angles. And so if you only ever practiced with like yourself, the robot and the pegs all in a line, it may look like a fairly easy problem because you can just line your robot up perfectly because you have a straight line of sight. But if you're in driver station number one and you're scoring on peg number mm -hmm. three, you can't even see peg number three from station number one. But if you're never practicing that combination of orientations, you're not gonna know that. Um, and, and then on the other end of the field, the gear pickup slot was 50 feet away from your driver station, but I see teams practicing on their YouTube videos where their driver's sitting like right next to the slot, right? And they're just like driving up to the slot and throwing the disc, like that is not valuable at all. So even if you don't have a full field, like what we've done in the past is we've actually like moved the driver station into another room to get 50 feet away and they're like looking through a doorway into the, the carpet that's on the other side of the other room just so you can get that distance and they can practice that coordination while not being right next to the robot where they'll never realistically be in a competition. So uh, yeah. it's harder to do if you don't have a full field, but it's still totally doable. Uh, another really funny example of this that I just recalled right now, in 2016, do you remember the, 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 the big pole wars that were happening then where teams had <laughs> sure those, those camera poles, yeah. right? Yeah. Because Depending on depending on what defenses were on the field, your view could be really obstructed. I, I have pictures. I wish I would have put them in the slides. But um, where we had a camera pole and a screen and everything for video feedback, for some of our practice sessions, even though we didn't have a full field, we right. put the camera pole up and we had the drivers face backwards, right? And so they had to drive off of the screens. Right while scoring and everything, and they couldn't look at the robot at all. So that's how we practiced them using the screens to like find balls that were hidden behind obstructions and stuff like that, because that was an important part of the game that year. So uh, yeah, those line of sight factors are a big deal and prepare for them, man, it can be a it can be a real shock to the driver when they get to the competition yeah. and they realize that they're not two feet away from the scoring element. Right, yeah, and you know, what you just mentioned, I was literally gonna mention that because I remember seeing your team practicing using their vision system only to drive because you're going to find situations where you need to do that if you're going to be in a location on the field trying to score or trying to pick up a game piece or whatever and your drivers need to learn to trust their vision system to either guide the robot to the object or allow the driver to see i mean this was this last season was a perfect example during the sandstorm where drivers either had to have a perfectly tuned limelight system to guide the robot into the robot, I mean, into the loading station or into the rocket or the cargo ship. Um, but most teams found that they could, their driver was just as effective using an on, a live camera feed. And you gotta practice that. That doesn't come instinctively. If the, if the student can see the robot in front of them, they're gonna look at the robot. But if you remember, when you were trying to position a cargo hatch on the backside of the robot, you could not see that 
from any position, any driver position. You had to yep. use either a live camera or you had to use um, a, a, vi a targeting system that could accurately position you. And yeah, if you don't practice that and get the drive team super comfortable with trusting their technology, they're always going to default to trying to look. Well, Sandstorm prevented that. Well, Sandstorm was yep. just a short period. Right, but you've got a whole match where that same situation is going to come up over and over and over. Yeah, you know. So even Steamworks, I mean, you had that. Even Steamworks had that huge tower right in the middle of the field. If you were on, <laughs> you know, if you were on, on drive position three and your loading station was diagonal across the field, you never saw the loading station. You had to trust your camera yep. to guide you in. So yeah, that that yep. is huge, it, and that's something that I think. Um, we're seeing more and more and more uh, in these uh, games is the reliance on vision to be a huge piece of how your robots operated. So just that it, you've yep. got to practice it. Yep, absolutely. All right, I think we're awesome. going to move on to taking some audience questions. Um, we have one in the chat already from Miguel Macias. How does your drive team change how you design the control for your robot? Or do you, do you guys choose your drive team with a general understanding of how the robot controls will be? Uh, uh, can I start that one? Because Miguel's one of my students. Yeah. Or alumni. He's okay. actually, he actually yeah. is student. It, it's a great question, Miguel. Um, he's actually uh, helped organize this whole thing, Capital City Classic, this year. So, uh, But great question because it does make a difference. We try to um, design, well, we, we try to choose our um, drive team and use their input as to how they want to control the robot. Um, Eagle Force recently, about four years ago, started using a steering wheel and a joystick to drive the robot. I mean, that gives you like 30 buttons to choose from, but we let our driver and our co-pilots choose which buttons do what, because that way they're, you know, it's what's normal for them. But now we're also using an Xbox controller. Typically the co-pilot uses an Xbox controller. <coughs> Pardon me. And, but again, they get to define which button does what, because it's just, if they're doing it without having to think about it and it's where they expect it to be, then, then we will, it's easy to program a button to do a function. That's, that's easy. So any button that they choose can be the function. Um, drive code, though, for actually driving the robot, we have, like I said, a, a set of tuning parameters, and we work with the driver to adjust those parameters for their preferences. But the actual choice of whether we're using dual joysticks or a steering wheel and one joystick, pretty much right now we're, we, we use one platform and... Uh, you know, if we have no driver that can drive it that way, then we'll modify. But pretty much we, this is the platform you'll use to drive. And then, and then we tune it to their preferences. At least that's our approach. Yeah. Uh, we're, uh, Bill, you, you broke it down exactly how I was going to break it down. You have the drive code and the, those related control inputs, which are going to stay constant year over year. And then you have all the buttons for the operator and, those are open for change. You know, I think we, we do the exact same thing. We have the software robot team normally throw out a first draft of the button commands mm -hmm. to the operator, but it's really important that your software students are um, open to feedback from your operator on what's working and what isn't working with regarding to the button scheme and stuff like that. We have another question from Caleb N. Do you have any tips for supporting the drive team when things go wrong and drive team morale is down? I'll, I'll, I'll hit this first. Um, so one thing uh, I talked about this actually recently with um, a, another team. Um, one thing I, I, I enjoy about having a, an adult as the drive coach is you're, you're able to be there in those moments. And then you're also able to uh, kind of take the, take the fall for any uh, mishaps in the match because ultimately like what we do on the field is is my decision as the drive coach and if something doesn't shake out the way we're hoping for it to 
uh, that ultimately falls on me. And so I think one of the one of that's one of the key things that that I do at least as a drive coach is um, make it known that like you know if something goes wrong and morale is starting to sink that you know like ultimately it was my call the thing that we did that may have resulted in a loss or uh, a poor match right um, but the the other the other the the flip side to that is um is keeping the the drive team uh you know goal oriented on what we're trying to accomplish you know i think i think it's natural uh to feel down about losing a match totally it's just a human thing to do i do it uh, i fully expect our drive team to do it too but it's a matter of um you know how do you how do you react in those moments and where do you go from there so it's really important to um you know i think it's cliche but to really like it's not just stay positive really because you're not just trying to ignore what happened but you want to be analytical you want to be practical you want to evaluate what happened and um and have a have a um, level-headed uh evaluation of of what went down and then work with your drive team and your pit team and any other you know groups that uh that have a have a say in things and evaluate what what, what happened and correct for the upcoming matches or the upcoming event um yeah it's it's really and as the drive coach you you really have to set the tone because the rest of your drive team is focused on their individual tasks fixing up the robot picking up the robot and moving it off the field after a loss stuff like that as a drive coach you need to steer the whole ship uh in in a in a productive direction not necessarily ignoring what happened but uh taking it as a as a lesson learned yeah yeah we we do a we have a process that we do uh, right after every single match. And um, we do a debrief. Win or lose, we do a debrief. And what we choose to do during that debrief is identify what we did right so we can repeat it, identify what we did wrong so we can avoid repeating it. And then each person in the team um, basically says, hey, look, I, I, I screwed up. I didn't do this right. This is, and we don't place blame. We just identify what each person, we let them identify it themselves. That's part of being a mature student is saying, hey, I made a mistake and I will do better. And that's all there is to it. And once they say they're going to do better, we move on. We don't, that's one thing at, at, on Eagle Force we don't do is point fingers and lay blame because that's non-productive. It actually it will drag a team down. And by allowing the students to um, identify where their weaknesses are, it allows them to build strength in those areas. So we do that every single match, you know, and, and like you said, Mike, um, it's ultimately the, the drive coach's responsibility for making the play or calling the plays on the, on the field. Uh, you're going to find that in any sport and it's the drive team's responsibility to execute those plays. You know, and, and then beyond that, uh, you know, everybody's now being accountable for their, their actions and they get to celebrate it together, right? They're, you know, mm -hmm. we all make mistakes. So the mistake isn't the issue. It's, and I think this is kind of what you said, it's we all make mistakes, but it's how you respond to that mistake that really makes a difference match after match, game, uh, tournament after tournament um, as to how your team's gonna perform. Yeah, so. Um, a question from Brianna. Do you have any tips for people hoping to be driver for their team to improve themselves on their own time, um, particularly during COVID when we can't physically control the robot? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think if you, if, you, if you rewind a little bit to what we talked about in the beginning, um, the if, if you're hoping to be a driver on the team, you know, I think I would think for most teams being a committed member is can be one of the key factors there. I, I know with the team that I mentor that that's a huge deal. So uh, finding ways to contribute and it's hard in COVID. It's hard even to like organize a team to, to do things in general. So being a leader and being proact uh, proactive and finding uh, ways to take on responsibility outside of drive team, uh, finding ways to take on responsibility and become a more involved leader on the team and just frankly putting in the work, putting in the hours. Uh, on your team is going to be probably one of the best things you can do to prepare for uh, hopes of being a, a drive team member. 
Yeah, I, I, I couldn't have said it any better, Mike. Um, I mean, it'd be easy to say something like, yeah, go play Mario Kart, you know, but that's really <laughs> not gonna help you be a better team member. Um, it's gonna yeah. teach you the skills of pushing buttons, but a drive team member or a driver for that matter, is they've got to be a lot more than just the person that makes the robot run. They've got to be a huge contributing portion of your team. And uh, every single year uh, since we've uh, taken on this new process of choosing that driver early, that's been the first thing we look at is not their skill level, but are they a contributing member to the team? That's, that's really where you want to start. Totally. We have time for one more, Ellie. Um, I don't think we have any more. Um, we have a question from Diego, actually. I'm not sure if it's necessarily relevant, but have you ever thought about switching to swerve drive in order to get better maneuverability? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, it I, is. I think swerve drives are really cool, but um, and we we practice with them in the off season. Um, so on the table. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we had a sponsor uh, that part of our proposal to them was to uh, use the funds that they provide us to build a swerve drive or to learn how to do swerve. And we were actually uh, fortunate enough to receive a sponsorship to pay for that. So we're literally in the process of selecting a swerve drive uh, instead of trying to design our own, we're going to go ahead and, and buy an off-the-shelf system, um, get it to our programmers early on, and then um, after they've learned to program it, then we'll actually build a frame for it, and then we can start the actual drive practice. But I'll, I'll tell you one thing, flat out, swerve is not something you want to put on a competition field until you've practiced, practiced, practiced with it. So, Yep, 100%. All right, I think that's all we have today. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Bill and Mike. This was a great panel. You bet. Um, thanks, Ellie. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie. We appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. It's good talking to you again.